Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the MCHD Paramedic Podcast 360. My name is Dr. Casey Patrick. Joining me today are two of our MCHD medics, Ashley Fillmore and Bianca Hines. And today we're going to talk through our delayed sequence intubation bundle here at MCHD. Realistically, as an educator, I feel like that we concentrate too much on the act of passing the tube through the cords and neglect the preparation and the physiologic stabilization that needs to happen before we actually make that passage. Not that intubating is not important, but if the patient is not stable and the patient has a bradycardic arrest or a hypoxic arrest before we even get to intubation, we've done the patient a disservice. So I'm going to give Ashley and Bianca a case to walk through and it will take us through all of the high points of getting the patient ready to intubate again through our DSI bundle. So we're gonna have a 56 year old male who calls EMS for shortness of breath. I'm gonna step off and let the experts go to work and narrate from the other side of the camera. Okay, I'm sure when you arrive on scene to your gentleman at short of breath, you're gonna want some vital signs. And we're not gonna drag out the obvious here. We've got a heart rate of 135, a respiratory rate of 45, sats of 67% on room air with a temperature of 102. The patient's speaking one to two word sentences, but obviously tired, looks a little altered, cyanotic, severely ill appearing patient. Tricotting, retractions, no edema, no JVD, got obvious, uh, again, obvious cyanosis and poor perfusion. The wife is able to give you quite a bit more history than the patient is, as he's in severe respiratory distress. She says that he's been short of breath for a week with fever and productive cough. So that should give you a pretty good picture of what you're looking at. What would be your differential diagnosis for the patient? Uh, COPD, exacerbation, possible pneumonia. Yeah, the fever and the productive mm -hmm. cough, Definitely. subacute onset surely makes you, makes you worry about infection. So where do you start with this gentleman? There's some obvious spots where you start. So what are you gonna do when you get to work? So he's hypoxic, hypoxic for sure. So we're gonna start with giving him oxygen to help raise his oxygen saturation. We're gonna uh, put a nano breather on him right now at 15 liters per minute while we um, get out the BiPAP or CPAP and utilize that. So this is just gonna kind of be our Band-Aid fix right now. I'm going to listen to breath sounds. You've got some ronchi and some wheezes bilaterally. Okay. Again, obvious retractions and poor air movement. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start administering him some albuterol. Hopefully that'll help open him up a little bit, which will also help raise his oxygen saturation. Um, in conjunction with the BiPAP or CPAP that we administer. Well, Bianca did a wonderful job securing the BiPAP mask, but unfortunately he's becoming more altered, more confused, more combative. He rips his mask off, rips your IV out. Now you have no access and SATs are again in the low 60s. All right, so at this point, um, our patient is in severe respiratory distress, pending respiratory failure. So we need to make sure that we um, start taking care of that so that it doesn't get bad. We're going to give him four milligrams per kilogram IM ketamine, which if he's approximately 100 kilograms, then that would be 400 milligrams um, to help sedate him. That way we can take care of his primary issue right now, which is the hypoxia. So we'll sedate him and then we'll start getting ready to do our rule of 15s, which would be... Walk us through the rule of 15s, Bianca. What are you going to do first? So what we're going to do first is that we're going to make sure he's on the nasal cannula. It would be okay to do an ECCO2 uh, with the fill in nasal cannula, but this will give him the best results when it comes to helping his oxygen uh, saturation go up. So we're going to add a nasal cannula right now. We've got nasal cannula at 15 liters. What other 15s do we have to fill, Ashley? So we have nasal cannula at 15 liters a minute. We currently have them on the monitor reader at 15 liters per minute. We're going to put the head of the bed at 15 or at 15 degrees, which will give us our ear to sternal notch, which is the most ideal position for whenever we go in to innovate. Um, and whenever we take over his airway to start breathing for him, um, or whenever we start ventilating him, we're going to make sure that we have the BVM at 15 liters a minute with PEEP of 15, as well as having two NPAs and an OPA in place. So the purpose of the rule of 15s, all you watchers out there, is to make sure that we are fully optimizing his pre-oxygenation. Realistically, the four milligrams per kilogram of ketamine that we administered is truly a procedural sedation dose, with the procedure being 
pre-oxygenation and nitrogen washout. This is to best optimize our oxygen status for intubation. So we've got NPOPs in place. We've got rule of 15s in place. If you're still intubating patients flat out there, please, please, please elevate the head of the bed of your patients while you're pre-oxygenating and intubating. Your visualization is going to be better. Your rates of aspiration will be lower and you're going to be more successful. So now we're in a holding pattern until what? What, what are our check boxes that we have to cross in order to proceed to the next step in our pharmacologic so pathway here. Prior to giving our paralytic, we want to make sure that our patient has a uh, systolic blood pressure of at least 90, and we want to make sure that he's a, at least 94% for three minutes. So that three minutes is a built-in time for us mm -hmm. to really slow down, talk with our team, if you're in charge, talk with your attendant, talk with your fire partners, make sure that you're verbalizing your plan, and why don't you walk through a little role play with Bianca, how you would talk through your plan during that three minutes to make sure that everybody's on the same page, actually. Okay, um, so obviously plan A is gonna be that we're gonna innovate, we're gonna use a channeled King Vision with a preloaded bougie into our ET tube. Um, and then if that fails, we're gonna put the eye gel in. If the eye gel fails, then we're going to do the surgical airway. So, so in our workspace, we have eye gel ready, we have channeled King Vision, ET tube preloaded with the bougie, and we have our surgical airway kit. All that is out and ready and prepared and within reach every single time. And that verbalization step in that 180 seconds that we minimum, at minimum, we're gonna have 180 seconds to stop, slow down, and talk through the process because during that time, pre-oxygenation nitrogen washout is taking place. And so it's a built-in time for us to decompress just for a second, verbalize, pre-plan, and hit our checklist and make sure all our supplies are ready. So what if I told you that you were at three minutes, you had good 96 to 98% oxygen saturation throughout your pre-oxygenation pattern, you recycled your blood pressure one last time before you're ready to push the rocker on him, and oh, now his pressure is 85 over 45. What do we do next? How do we deal with that? So thankfully we will already have a pre push dose presser already mixed up and ready to go. In the case that that does happen, we can quickly um, get on top of that. Um, the way that we prepare that is we use either Epi 1 to 1 or Epi 1 to 10 and put it in a 100 ml bag. Um, and that will give you a 100 mics of a push dose presser in 10 mls. Our dose here is 20 micrograms. Um, so if he's hypotensive like that, we're going to administer 20 micrograms of push dose presser epi to hopefully help bring his blood pressure up a little bit so that we can administer the rocky uranium. And again, we know that giving a patient paralytics, whether it's succinylcholine, rocky uranium, vecuronium, name the paralytic. If you push a paralytic and a patient is hypoxic or hypotension, your risk of peri-intubation, cardiac arrest skyrockets. Mm -hmm. So we for dosing consistency sake and to prevent errors, we've adapted our protocol of push dose presser here at MCHC to take it and simplify it as much as possible to decrease that risk of overdose. And we take one milligram of epinephrine and put it in 100 cc's of fluid. That gives you that dose of 10 micrograms per milliliter, whether you use one to 10,000 or one to 1,000 epinephrine. And we can argue about whether it's 18 to 21, 18 to 19.8, 19.1. We're never going to overdose a patient by mixing one milligram in 100 cc's of normal saline and using two milliliter doses, 20 microgram doses of push dose pressure. So now we're ready for rocuronium. Our pressure's back up to 110 over 50. You guys have pre oxygenated you planned, you've hit your checklist. What's a rocuronium dose? Oh, one milligram per kilogram. So now we're ready to intubate. Let's walk the viewers through what that looks like here at MCHD. So how would, how would you uh, assist Ashley Bianca and what would be your steps? All right, so we're gonna have our King Vision, we have our ET tube, we have our Bougie, we have our uh, 10 cc syringe. We're gonna make sure that our tube doesn't have any holes in it. Good. Thank you, this is our suction. 
always leave with suction, whether there's vomit in the airway or not, because you never know what's in there whenever you enter. Um, we have the tube armor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Gotta get the tube secured. Yeah. Got our viral filter in place. Yep, we got our viral filter. We make sure that we have end tidal as well, because that is the number one thing that we use to verify tube placement. Um, we have our push dose presser. We're gonna have our post sedation drawn up. We have our rocky rhodium drawn up. Um, we have our eye gel out and our surgical airway kit out and in reach just in case we need it. Um, we will formulate a plan. So whenever I try to go into innovate, um, when I'm ready, I will let you know. You're gonna stop bagging and to minimize the length of time that we're not bagging this patient, I want you to grab a hold of the OPA and the NPA um, as well whenever you stop. That way I can immediately go in with the King Vision. Awesome. Thank you. Reconnect the suction, there you go. All right, I agree. So turn this on, you can load it. I'll take all this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. suction suction and I like to use my suction as a way to lift the tongue a little bit too and it helps get all the way in the back on larger patients I go in from the side especially if they have large breasts or they're obese have large chests um, it helps make sure that the uh, camera stays in place I see the vocal cords and the upper glottis advancing the bougie I'm gonna advance the tube the tube is in. I'm going to inflate the tube while I'm still in there. That way I can make sure that the tube stays in place after I inflate it. Good, that's still in. I'm gonna set this to the side. We have our end title on. I'm gonna hold on to the tube. We're not gonna move it until we can verify that it's in there, which would be with end title. I'm just gonna listen to breast sounds. We Work. are. Back in the olden days when I trained, we listened for breath sounds, we watched for chest rise and fog and tube, and we know all those things, while important, are definitely fallible. Okay. So where are your eyes focused as soon as that tube passes, okay. Bianca? What are you watching? We're watching for the black, um, our black mark to go through the um, upper glottis. That's going to be a good landmark for us to so you're watching the camera and then when you see it passes through, where do your eyes turn, Ashley? What are you watching next? I'm looking at the chest, making sure I see chest rise and fall, but most importantly, I'm looking at the end title to make sure that I have capnography waveform. Watching for that waveform capnography, it's gold standard. If that capnography starts to stair step downward, then we pull the tube. Pull the tube. Where is the tube? It it's is in, in the, the esophagus. esophagus. No ifs, ands, or buts. So now that you've got the patient, you've got tube secured, we've got our tube in place, we've worked together like a well-oiled machine, what is the next and most important step as we're packing the patient and ready to ride? So we need to make sure that we do post-sedation as so well. Post-intubation sedation is vital. To the listeners out there, this all comes down to timing. And we've moved to longer acting neuromuscular blockade with rocuronium, 60 minutes plus. Mm -hmm. And when we have our sedatives, no matter what we choose, whether it's propofol, midazolam, ketamine at MCHD safe, all of those sedatives are going to come in with half-lives less than rocuronium. So that means that our pre-procedural pre-oxygenation dose is not going to last us throughout transport. The patient will be awake and paralyzed when that ketamine wears off in 20 to 30 minutes. Rocuronium, 60 minutes. So we have to protocolize and auto give that second dose of ketamine as soon as we're prepped, tube secured, uh, ready to transport. That second dose of ketamine has to be reflexive, just like taking a breath. We don't even think about it. We just give it because we know that we have to provide sedation over 60 minutes plus mm -hmm. because that's how long the paralytic's gonna last. So again, there's the act of passing the tube, which we feel is vital. You know, the skill of intubation is vital to know as an emergency provider. But just as vital is how we prepare to pass the tube and how we manage the patient following tube passage to prevent hemodynamic compromise and to prevent 
a state of awake paralysis. There's um, there's nothing worse than, than attempting to intubate and having a patient crash and arrest before you even get to passing the tube. And I can't imagine much else worse than being awake and paralyzed. So and that wraps us up with today's episode of the MCHD Paramedic Podcast 360. I'd like to take another opportunity to thank Bianca and Ashley for joining us today. As always, if you have questions, ideas for future podcasts or anything you'd like to discuss more with us, reply in the comments here on YouTube or hit us up at the podcast email, podcast at mchd-tx.org. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Leave us a like if you get a chance and we'll talk to everybody again soon.